begin the first panel in the afternoon on the topic recovering the economy, the role of competition policy. <clears throat> I'd like, first of all, to congratulate the Portuguese Competition Authority, its president, Marquinhos Matos Rosa, and members of the board for organizing this important and timely conference and to thank it for the invitation to moderate this panel. It is an honor and a privilege indeed to share, if not the stage, then at least the screen, uh, with five distinguished speakers, whom I shall now introduce um, in alphabetical order, which will be uh, the same of uh, their opening speeches. <clears throat> Andres Mund, president of the Bundeskartelamt, the German Federal Competition Authority since 2009, Antonio Ferreira Gomes, Deputy Director at the Directorate for Financial and Enterprise Affairs of the OECD, former President of the Portuguese Competition Authority. Julio Federico, <clears throat> Head of Unit at the Recovery and Resilience Task, Task Force of the European Commission. Teresa Moreira, Head of Competition and Consumer Policies branch of UNCTA, the United Nations Trade uh, 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 Conference on Trade and Development, former member of the board of the Portuguese Competition Authority, and Bill Kovacic, <coughs> professor of law at the George Washington University Law School and visiting professor at King's College, he has been previously member and chairman of the Federal Trade Commission of the United States. <clears throat> I do not think we could have a better lineup of speakers to address the theme of this second panel of the day. The aim of this panel is to gather ideas and views on the role that can or should um, play competition policy and competition authorities <coughs> the Commission and the national authorities in Europe in promoting the recovery of economies after the brutal recession caused by the pandemic. A recovery that uh, be as far as possible and as, is, and as is the motto of the Portuguese presidency of the Union, digital, green and fair. <clears throat> and with what instruments? traditional enforcement, possibly stronger, or the contrary, more flexible? And what role for competition advocacy? And what articulation with other policies and distinct state interventions? The complexity of competition policy is inevitably present in its enforcement, particularly in periods of extreme difficulty such as the one we are going through. And its complexity seems very different, <laughs> very different depending on the capacities in which it is apprehended. Here we are mainly among enforcers and we'll be among enforcers in this panel. However, the panel, this panel is plural. In the origin, the background, and the thinking of its five members. Each of them has been free to choose their own angle of approach, which may result in complementary interventions or in contradictory debate. Moreover, we will also appeal to all participants present in this room or behind their computers somewhere. <coughs> this is the digital transition underway to express their opinions on some of the topics covered. Our speakers will have the opportunity to comment on those opinions, allowing for a creative contrast. They will also have the opportunity to answer one or more questions posed by the participants. For that to be possible, <clears throat> we have in place online tools allowing 
opinion polls and uh, uh, Q and answers with all participants. In this panel, we have planned two opinion polls and two Q&A sessions after the five initial intervention by the speakers. I encourage you all to enter the conference application, either to vote in each opinion poll, there will be three options to answer each time, or to send questions you would like to ask the speakers, and among which we will select two or three for reply and comment. We uh, try to apply a criterion in that selection as objective as possible, um, a criterion based on the pertinence um, of the questions in the light of the topic under discussion. Mm. My apologies uh, for uh, my apologies for uh, those who will be left out. Unfortunately, it is inevitable given the limited time available. Before giving the floor to our speakers, please allow me to express two further thanks. One to the speaker themselves, the speakers themselves, for their availability and patience with which they accepted my proposals for organizing the session. The other one to the organizing team, starting with Antonio Siabra Ferreira, who uh, were unrivaled in their availability and competence in helping to prepare this debate. I shall now give the floor to the first speaker, Andreas Munt. You have the floor. Well, um, I hope you can hear and see me well, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. First of all, I want to say a, a, a good afternoon uh, to you, Jose Luis, and most of all to Margarita Martins Rosa. Um, it's, it's really a pity we cannot be in Lisbon. I love the European competition, though, to be frank. It takes you to great cities, you meet great people, you have wonderful topics, great panels. So this is uh, better than not meeting, uh, but I, I really do miss um, our regular meeting and I hope it's gonna be feasible in due time. Well, I think uh, it is a very topical issue that we are debating about today. Um, we do not know yet exactly how fast uh, we are going to leave the COVID-19 crisis behind us. But what we see is that uh, circumstances are getting better in various European and, and uh, beyond European countries. And there will be the question, how do we get back to a normal economic path? What, we, what can we do for economic growth? And what is the role of competition during that time? What is the role of competition policy? And again, what can competition agencies do to help the economy to uh, recover. Um, what we often hear in these times, and I heard that already during the financial crisis or right after the financial crisis back in 2008, 2009, that we should weaken competition policy, that we should uh, give more economic freedom, so to say, to, to companies. And already by then, we hesitated very much and made very clear um, that uh, weakening competition policy definitely is not the answer to get back to economic growth and to make clear that economic growth will be gained back by strong competition policy and by a, a strong com application of competition law. So, I would like um, to, to stretch that out in four points uh, today in how far we maybe have to adapt in applying competition law and where maybe uh, we have to be, uh, we have to be, uh, where we have to be strict. I think we all agree that in the circumstances that we have seen over the past um, 15 months, it is very clear 
that the state cannot just stand at the sideline and watch what is happening, that, that the economy needs some uh, support, government support, state aid, maybe more cooperation among, uh, among co competitors in order to mitigate the negative consequences of crisis uh, times. But I think during that time, um, also limits and rules have to be respected. Crisis does not mean that you act without rules. It makes, it makes sense that you might change the rules to a certain extent under which you act. And here I would like to mention four points that seem to me, seem to be important to me. Um, the first one is on cooperation and state. I think we as competition agencies and also policymakers worldwide might agree that the ban on cartels um, is not at disposition and that we should enforce uh, the law against hard hardcore, hardcore cartels like price cartels, like other agreements very, very strictly. But what we also know is that market conditions have changed in a way that companies need to cooperate in a different way than in the past. Um, business activities have been vastly interrupted during, during the crisis. And in order to mitigate the effects of this uh, disruption, I do believe that some, some cooperation can be very helpful in the future, during that time now, in terms of horizontal and vertical uh, cooperation. It is very clear to us that companies are under considerable time pressure during that time. So we have taken a very consistent approach here in the Federal Cartel Office uh, to assess cooperations among companies with regard to COVID-19 uh, to um, to, uh, to answer these requests under uh, the following guidelines. Um, we quickly informed the company that um, the cooperation is unlikely to be taken up by the Bundeskartellamt within three or four boundaries. The first one is um, companies can only agree on this within the bounds of what is necessary. So it should not be disproportionate to the circumstances that we find. The second point is any cooperation among companies should not be discriminatory and should not exclude others uh, to prevent a competitive advantage for those who are part of that cooperation vis-a-vis -vis those who are not part of the cooperation. The third point is that we should ask companies to inform us about the nature of the cooperation constantly in the further course in order to make sure that cooperation does not change in a way that might be anti-competitive in the very end. And last but not least, and I think this is the most important parameter, that coordination needs to be terminated after the end of the crisis. Um, I think that is the most important point because if you have unusual circumstances, you can react. But if these unusual circumstances come to an end, you should act again and limit and end these uh, corporations. I don't believe this is a lenient approach to uh, competition law. It just takes into account the different economic environment in which uh, companies act. And by the way, it's a bit similar with state aid. Usually, I think most competition people are not so much in favor of state aid, but during that time, again, I think the state cannot just stand at the sidelines. And giving state aid to companies is very much under the, head, the same headline as uh, corporations among these companies um, to make sure that state aid is not disproportionate, uh, to make sure that it is not discriminatory, and to make sure that state aid comes to an end when uh, the crisis uh, comes to an end. I think that is very important because also stated is a means um, to, to, uh, to distort competition because those who receive state aid have better financing times than companies who don't, just to give you an example. So also here, a very important feature, get out of it as soon as the crisis has come to an end.
Second point is on merger control. I, I don't think um, that we should have a lenient approach to mergers because unlike corporations, mergers are not temporary. They have permanent consequences. Mergers have a long-term structural effect. So competition authorities need to be particularly uh, vigilant with regard uh, to mergers. Merger control is the most powerful tool uh, that we have. And once a merger has been implemented, we can only intervene with difficult and timely, time-consuming abuse uh, proceedings. So even during the crisis, I think uh, we should make use of that tool in a very vigilant, um, in vigilant manner. Um, that is maybe especially true for some areas of the economy. And here I speak about the digital economy, where we all already today find that markets are highly concentrated. So mergers can have the consequence that concentrated, already concentrated markets are going to tip. Further takeovers might create new ecosystems, new platforms, or might strengthen these ecosystems and platforms. I think this is why we should not reduce our efforts. We have made that very clear in a joint statement with our colleagues uh, from Australia, the ACCC, with our colleagues from the UK, the CMA, in a joint statement. I think this is of, of utmost importance. And here you can clearly see that competition is a part to drive us out of the crisis. That takes me to platforms in general, my third point. Uh, the winners of the crisis are platforms, are ecosystems, um, are gatekeepers. Um, I think Amazon is a great example for that. Amazon was able to increase its operating uh, result by more than 120% in the first quarter of 2021 compared to the first quarter of 2022. Uh, Amazon's profit even increased by 22% during the same period. So you can see, clearly see who is a winner of the crisis uh, that we have had. Such increases in platform markets uh, may be at the expense of smaller competitors or maybe um, at the expense of, uh, of the market counterparty. I think therefore competition authorities need tools. Like we have just received in Germany the new Article 19a or tools like uh, tools that are in progress with regard to the DMA, the Digital Markets Act at the level of the European uh, Commission in order to be able to address digital competition issues quickly and as effectively as possible. If we only act in the area of digital market on the basis of traditional competition law, I think it could work, but what we see is that we need a less effects-based approach, that we need to cooperate more with presumptions for just one single reason. Our proceedings have to become faster. We need more speed. Sometimes it takes years until we are able to take a decision against one of these big tech giants uh, decades in the digital world. So I think new tools to be brought forward in order to re-establish or in order to strengthen competition uh, are really needed. My fourth point uh, is not so much visible, it's more on advocacy. Uh, we, leave, we live at times where there are strong voices who say, well, we need to be more lenient with mergers. We need to be more lenient with corporations. Um, I think we as competition agencies, we as heads of competition agencies, we have a strong task here to make clear that uh, competition and competition policy is a strong means to get well out of that crisis, that we have to apply competition law in a consistent and stringent manner also in the future. So I really believe this is a high time for competition advocacy, and this is why I'm very happy uh, that Portugal under its presidency has chosen exactly that topic today because this provides an excellent platform also for us to make clear uh, that we want and that we need to apply competition law in a very stringent manner also in the past. Many thanks.
straight to the point to the uh, 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 to focus on four important points you laid the ground i think you laid the ground uh, for our next debate um, now i move on the floor to antonio ferreira gomes you have the word thank you so much uh, jose luis uh, good afternoon to to all of you it is an immense pleasure to take part in this European Competition Day in, in Lisbon, even if only virtually, and I would also uh, have preferred to be able to join you uh, in, in Lisbon. I would like to start by thanking Margarida Mar Matos Rosa for the kind invitation and to congratulate her and the ADC, uh, not only for organizing this event, but also for their outstanding and vigorous role in protecting and promoting competition in Portugal. As many of you may know, the OECD was originally established to administer the Marshall Plan. And today we are experiencing uh, challenging health, economic and social times, uh, and the most serious economic crisis since World War II in circumstances that some have compared to times of war. Faithful to our motto of better policies for better lives, the OECD has been focused in helping governments respond to the crisis, but also to prepare a recovery that is strong, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable. Competition policy is key, not only in the immediate term, but also in the medium to long term to build back better, or to build forward better, not only through enforcement, but also by permeating into the design of support and recovery measures and programs. This should be forward-looking in nature, considering the longer-term impact on the functioning of markets. Past crises can provide uh, important insights, and the OECD has looked at empirical research on past crises, and there are several lessons uh, to be drawn from uh, this empirical research. First, suspension of antitrust laws holds back recovery, and this is exactly what Andreas Munt was just saying uh, uh, a while ago. This was the case in the US Great Depression, where the suspension of some key provisions of antitrust rules by the Roosevelt administration is estimated to have prolonged the crisis for seven additional years. Second, anti-competitive policies can hinder <coughs> economic recovery. During the 90s crisis in Japan, policies that restricted competition, including import barriers and price controls, led to widespread cartelization and prolonged the recession. Third, lax merger control in times of crisis does not improve long-term resilience. The big bank mergers of the late 90s and 2000s in Japan did not deliver the intended scale economies, neither did they reduce the probability of failure of, failure of those banks. And in a similar way, if we look at the global financial crisis, for example, the UK's Lloyd's uh, H-Boss uh, merger is a good example where approving a merger to safeguard financial stability despite competition concerns did not ultimately prevent a subsequent bailout. Fourth, crisis can be a good opportunity to identify and strengthen pro-competitive structural reforms. A good example is the comprehensive policy package of pro-competitive reforms in Greece in the context of the global financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis, where the OECD supported the Greek institutions in identifying regulatory barriers to competition in several sectors. Let me highlight three main points on the role of competition policy for recovery. Governments should respect the principle of uh, competitive neutrality when deploying state support and when designing their recovery plans. Second, competition authorities should support governments and also advocate for structural and regulatory pro-competitive reforms. 
Competition authorities man must maintain effective levels of enforcement and will need to be adequately empowered and resourced. In this far part of the, uh, this first part of our discussion, I want to focus on the first uh, two points. First on competitive neutrality. State support can disrupt the dynamics of market entry, exit and expansion of firms, distorting the competitive process and preventing the healthy reallocation of resources. This is why it is so important to guarantee a level playing field through competitive neutrality. The OECD has very recently adopted a recommendation on competitive neutrality. Selective state support that benefits only some competitors may put firms that may be more efficient, more productive, more innovative at a disadvantage. And this reduces their profitability, their incentives to invest and innovate, and may even force them uh, to exit the market. So competition authorities are well-placed to provide advice to governments in designing support measures, given their wealth of market knowledge and also their enforcement experience. And this can guide governments in assessing the potential costs and benefits of alternative policy measures to help minimize long-term market distortions. State support should be channeled to firms that were financially viable prior to the pandemic. It should be proportionate, i.e. it should not go beyond the losses incurred during the, uh, due to the crisis when we compare it to the counterfactual scenario uh, if the COVID-19 had not uh, occurred. However, state support measures may be more problematic for sectors where the shock is not temporary, but instead is uh, permanent. And this permanent shock may be a direct result of COVID, but it may also result from policy choices such as green policies. State support risks uh, artificially preserving an industry or a sector that is declining. And when this is the case, state interventions could rather focus on supporting scaling down and restructuring. State support should include clawback mechanisms to allow for the easy, easy recovery of any support that is found to be disproportionate at a later date. And it may also require uh, compensatory measures or remedies when competition distortions are expected to outweigh the positive effects of such uh, state aid. And this could be structural or behavioral remedies to help reduce barriers to entry and market power. Um, uh, state support should also foresee exit strategies, and Andreas was uh, precisely mentioning this, and uh, sunset clauses, to avoid that aid remains beyond what is necessary. Exit should occur as soon as conditions allow for governments to obtain value for money for taxpayers and conditions for competition are ensured. Any privatizations resulting from exits should uh, follow open transparent and non-discriminatory uh, processes, and any structural competition problems should be addressed prior to the privatization. So as I mentioned before, the crisis is a unique opportunity to advocate for structural and regulatory competitive reforms. Regulation may unnecessarily restrict competition, and government should identify where such restrictions are not justified given the intended policy objectives of regulation, they should eliminate those restrictions or design less restrictive policies. And this can have a significant impact in the long-term functioning of markets. This crisis may be an opportunity for competition authorities to revisit all the recommendations to governments that they have made over the last few years. And thus they can help identify areas for reform. The uh, OECD recommendation on competition assessment and the competition assessment toolkit of the OECD can be quite useful in this exercise. And undertaking competition uh, assessment as a basis for reform can support the recovery after efforts, can stimulate investment and innovation, including green innovation, and can promote um, growth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. <clears throat> Thank you for your vibrant plaidoyer for uh, competition policy <laughs> in times of crisis and uh, your optimistic uh, view. Um, I hope it is op optimistic uh, um, uh, on the 
uh, uh, on the crisis as a unique opportunity uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, um, uh, promoting uh, the necessary changes. Uh, um, now, uh, we'll come back, we'll come back to uh, uh, those uh, uh, points covered by Andreas and by Antonio uh, in, the, um, in the, uh, the first opinion poll. It's uh, uh, exactly uh, focused on uh, um, the options uh, raised in your um, interventions. Now, I, uh, uh, let's move on to Giulio uh, Federico. Uh, Giulio, you have the floor. Thank you uh, very much, Luis, and good afternoon to, to everyone. Uh, for me, too, it's a real pleasure to be, to be back in Lisbon, even if only virtually, and so I'm very grateful to uh, Margarida and Sofia for the kind invitation. It's also a way for me to come back uh, to the competition world for a few hours, because, as you may know, I've now, I'm now working, as I also announced, Luis, I'm now working at the Recovery Task Force of the European Commission that's um, coordinating uh, the, the work on the recovery and resilience facility that the, the Council agreed to uh, in July last year. So I'll try to bring you a perspective from my current job and my previous job in DG competition on, um, on how I see the two uh, levels really interacting. So the, the, the recovery, the work on the recovery uh, facility and packages with member states in Europe and uh, the role for competition authorities, including the GCOMP in particular, but more generally uh, in, in that process. So I'll first start with a couple of minutes on just to make this very concrete. What does the European recovery instrument look like? Because I think this will give, give us also give you some perspective on in practice what role competition policy can play can play there. So the, the facility is, a, is effectively a facility that will grant uh, grants, so non-repayable support of roughly, of just over 300 billion euros to member states and also loans of uh, 360 billion euros as well over the period between 2021, so now and 2026. And this is a facility that will uh, provide funds uh, to member states according to allocation keys that reflect uh, the, the economic performance and the economic wealth of member states and therefore has an inbuilt in it a de facto insurance mechanism so that member states that were hit most from the crisis uh, receive higher allocation. So the allocation would range between 10 to 12 percent in countries like Greece, Croatia or Bulgaria to a level like 6 to 7 percent for a number of countries including Spain and, and Portugal. So, for example, Portugal will receive roughly 14 billion of grants and has already requested close to 3 billion of, uh, of loans. Um, now, the plans are, have been submitted to the, to the most plans have been submitted to the Commission uh, by April 30th. Actually, Portugal was the first on April 22nd, and, uh, and the Commission is currently in its evaluation process of, this, of these uh, plans. I say evaluation because, you know, a bit like also what Antonio was also saying now, I mean, uh, as part of the assessment of, of the plans, the Commission has set a number of criteria uh, for the plans to be approved ultimately by the Council. And those criteria include not only elements of investment, in particular investments towards the twin transition, green and digital, I'll come back to that, but also elements of policy reform, uh, reforms that need to be effectively carried out as part of the plans to ensure that the money is effectively well spent and member states become more resilient in their um, over time as part of the recovery efforts. So the potential future crises are handled more effectively or are less likely. And, and that's so that's for the complementarity reform and investments which you know, in the European facilities captured by um, the adherence to the recommendations, the country specific recommendations that the council has made to member states over the past years. In particular, we're looking at the recommendations of 2019, 2020. Now that's, that's a broad framework of a real recovery instrument. This is a European one, so just as an example. Uh, and I see three interactions with competition policy. 
the first perhaps is relatively straightforward is the interplay with state aid. Now, it's important to bear in mind here that the, these plans do not substitute or prejudge state aid control. State aid control apply to investments carried out as, as part of these plans. They, they effectively, the funds are treated like own resources by the government and therefore subject to the completely normal state aid process. And that's important to, for two reasons. One, to avoid zero sum subsidy races between member states, where member states try to attract particular uh, investments from each other without really contributing to the growth of the, of the European Union as a whole, but also to make sure that investments are efficient, that they focus on areas of market failures, that don't, they don't crowd out private investments, which would have happened anyway, otherwise, so they maximize the leverage, the impact of the public funds, that they achieve cost efficiency, and hence, for example, rely where possible on tenders, competitive public procurement processes to make sure that the value for money is maximized as part of these interventions. And I think this is important, not just uh, from an efficiency perspective, but also in terms of, uh, of public support and democratic legitimacy to ensure that the money is well spent, in particular in the context of the European facility where the money is actually is raised centrally by the Commission through its own resources and borrowing requirements. So state aid continues to play and will continue to play a role in these packages. Uh, institutionally, the Commission has worked very closely using its collegiate approach to make sure that DG competition was always part of the assessment of the plans, not only currently in a formal assessment, but also in a strategic dialogue with member states that took place over the last uh, few months to ensure that investments that look like problematic from a perspective are, are adjusted accordingly, so that when those investments are notified, if they need to not noti notified, the CD control process will be smoother and there'll be uh, fewer requirements for adjustments. So again, no prejudging of the outcome, but an attempt to make sure that the, the two legs, state aid control and the rescue package as such, work hand in hand together. This, the second uh, interaction with competition policy is a, is a reform element in particular. So as I mentioned, there is a reform agenda which is quite prominent in these plans. And many of the country specific recommendations that the Commission has issued over the past couple of years actually talk about competition policy indirectly, in particular in the services sector. So a number of member states, I think nine or 10 in the last couple of years, have received from the council recommendations to reduce regulatory barriers in the service, in professional services and open to competition. Uh, these, these reforms will be taken up in many of the relevant uh, plans, recovery plans. So you'll see over the next few weeks, when the plans are, are published, or in fact, some of them are already public, uh, that elements of these pro-competitive reforms are included in, in the plans. I think that's important, and Antonio has mentioned that, to ensure that the, uh, the recovery phase is used also to, as also, you know, to build back better. We'll come to it in the Q&A later. And I think there is, this is explicit in the, in the European design of the recovery package. And the third element is one which is, my, which is uh, well, I think it talks, it applies both to green and digital transition, but I'd like to speak about the green transition now. Uh, that, as I mentioned, uh, the recovery package has a, has a clear focus to ensure that investments and reforms go in the direction of support, enabling, and accelerate the green transition. Uh, in Europe, in the, at the Commission level, this is taken in the form of two main levers. One, a target of close to 40% of all the investments need to be spent on climate-related expenditures. And on top, all investments and reforms cannot do harm to um, the six environmental objectives defined in the European taxonomy on sustainable investment. This is a do no harm uh, they do not see any harm principle. So there is effectively an ex ante layer of direct gov directing the, the government expenditure, channeling and leveraging private sector expenditure in a way to focus, again, on market failures, where we think uh, the climate uh, change uh, challenge 
is not fed by, by, by the private sector or relying on, on current price signals. And th there needs to be further uh, effort by investment or reform in, in those areas. So we're talking about investments in renewable generation, uh, in green hydrogen, in sustainable transport, and often in, in renovation. Now, having done that, you know, once a rescue package sets the rules of the game in that way to ensure that spending and reforms focus on, on green issues, then I think competitive markets are effectively a way to multiply or leverage those effects to make sure that the fact of those reforms and expenditure on final outcome is, is channeled in the most efficient way. Now, and why is that? I mean, one, if one is a normal, was a standard monotatic effect, in competitive markets, prices reflect signals provided by government intervention, uh, for example, in carbon prices in a more efficient way, and hence uh, the mechanism <clears throat> signals the need for, um, for efficient uh, consumption and production decisions. So in that way, they will ensure that whatever the government does ex ante in terms of regulatory intervention has an impact on the marketplace uh, as well in a more efficient way. And the second effect is a dynamic effect in the sense that, uh, and you know, linked to green innovation in competitive markets, firms face stronger incentive to invest in new technologies or ways of producing that respond to, for example, higher CO2 prices or strict environmental standards. Because in competitive markets, more sales are contestable and therefore investing in green innovation allows you to effectively take more business from your rivals and, and profit from that green innovation. So. In a rescue package, if well designed, you can you can in, 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 enable ex-ante regulation that makes green innovation more valuable and important for firms, and then exposed competition policy can ensure that this effect is fully maximized and delivered by the marketplace. So there's a fundamental complementarity here, which I think should not be forgotten, and actually therefore makes the role of rigorous competition policy, and I think both Andreas and Antonio mentioned this, even more important in the context of a recovery per process. So, so Lisa, I'll stop here. I'm afraid I haven't disagreed yet with my fellow co-panelists, but perhaps you'll find other grounds for us to disagree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. Um, we just have one hour and a half. Could, could we have a double to three hours to discuss so rich interventions? Thank you very much, Julio. Um, now, I pass the floor on to uh, Teresa, Teresa Moreira. <clears throat> Teresa, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, José Luis. I hope you are hearing me well. Uh, I also would like to um, warmly thank Margarida Matos Rosa, the president of the Portuguese Competition Authority, for this very kind invitation. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to join. I wanted to send greetings to all the friends and colleagues of the Portuguese Competition Authority, of course, and congratulations for putting together such an interesting conference. Well, how come is one of the United Nations organization to, to join uh, this European Competition Day? I think this fits very well um, under the Green Europe and Global Europe priorities of the Portuguese Presidency of the EU Council. So allow me just a few words to start on um, ANCTAD's uh, mandate uh, and its focus. So um, ANCTAD, well, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, uh, exists in 64 to better assist developing countries in integrating the world economy through, of course, trade, finance, technology, and also competition law and policy. So our uh, targets are really developing countries, countries with economies in transition and least developed countries. And we are the focal point for competition law and policy within the United Nations system because we are the guardians of the United Nations set of principles and rules of competition adopted in 1980 as uh, the only until now multilaterally agreed instrument uh, in this field, even though, of course, it is a set of recommendations and a soft law type instrument. It is very interesting because it really encourages developing countries to include competition law and policy within their growth and development strategies, 
although it recognizes what we call the development dimension, that is to say, the legitimacy of developing countries to adopt and implement competition law and policy according to their special circumstances, which I think is relevant for the discussion of today. Now, let me turn to um, the COVID-19 crisis and uh, UNCTAD's work. Of course, as other organizations, we have also assessed in, in transversal, horizontal and sector and team specific uh, manner the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I wanted to draw your attention to a publication that was released in November 2020, um, where, of course, a number of issues were, uh, were, were addressed, namely how competition law and policy uh, was a key instrument to uh, allow developing countries to um, face the challenges brought up by the pandemic and, above all, to transition to the recovery after COVID-19. Now, I also would like to say that uh, we are currently holding our uh, UN Trade Forum second edition, which is entitled Towards a Green and Inclusive Recovery. And yesterday I was chairing a panel where a representative from the least developed countries, uh, that is to say the 46 less developed countries of the world, was um, highlighting how uh, there is, in, their, in his opinion, a green squeeze, that is to say, uh, businesses and least developed countries really feel that they face um, additional, even um, two uh, big challenges just to fully commit to the green transition. And I think this is something that really justifies, again, a sort of adjusted approach to, um, to the economic recovery uh, packages. Now, ANCTA last year, of course, recommended some actions as of April 2020. Some of these actions coincide with the measures and initiatives that were undertaken by competition authorities uh, across the globe. It was actually very interesting to see that even in the developing world, competition authorities were really at the forefront of the initial responses against well, anti-competitive business practices and abuses of market power of global players, underlining how competition law and policy is important, uh, indispensable, crucial in times of crisis. But from this, I would like to turn to some uh, concrete ideas. Of course, as other colleagues um, uh, and fellow panelists, I would like to talk about briefly of the recommended active role of competition authorities uh, in the design and implementation of economic recovery plans so that it is possible to strike a balance between the urgent need of revitalizing businesses and saving jobs and the long-term goal of preserving a fairer and equitable market. And this, of course, can be achieved only through advocacy. And sometimes what is not very obvious is that this is not just for competition authorities to develop this role, but also for governments to understand uh, how competition authorities should be actively involved, heard, and provide advice throughout this period. But my two concrete points relate to SMEs and micro and small and uh, medium-sized companies because they were the most seriously hit by the pandemic, suffered the heavier losses, and several had well, went bankrupt or had to close. And as the engine of development, especially in uh, smaller and uh, less, less um, developed economies, they need to be supported through public policies. In most cases, this was done or is being done through debt finance, so loans and guarantees, employment support and tax relief measures, amongst others. But definitely, competition can also have an important uh, role to play in order to make sure that markets uh, remain open, accessible, especially to MSMEs and that allow them to um, contribute to job creation, innovation, and economic growth. This implies continuing to support and engage with MSMEs directly or their um, representatives through the exceptional exemptions of cooperation agreements, as we have heard. And I would like to say that also providing guidance in a clear and an ambiguous manner is extremely important. And I would like to highlight experience from 
Singapore guidance of Malaysia uh, safe harbors and El Salvador exemptions of joint purchasing agreements, um, namely related to public procurement, and also incorporate this idea of fair competition, uh, namely regarding digital economy. This was already addressed by Andrea especially, but I think it is extremely important so that MSMEs are allowed access and fair terms and conditions to uh, use digital platforms to export and to expand um, their uh, products and their services worldwide. Uh, this may need, of course, uh, strengthening legislative and regulatory competition frameworks and even reinforce uh, um, reinforce enforcement powers, uh, which leads me to the final point on international cooperation. Of course, from the UN point of view, international cooperation is important now more than ever, uh, which I believe is shared with the, by the other uh, speakers and the organizations that they represent, especially in what concerns cross-border cases. Of course, for developing countries that have small or less resource competition authorities, this is clearly vital, and we do make the best um, um, well, possible case for the need to expand uh, and, and strength, especially regional cooperation, because so many regional economic organizations have adopted regional competition rules, namely in the African continent, and sometimes if at national level, resources and capacities are not enough to face multinationals, uh, anti-competitive uh, business practices, uh, it is good to know that at regional level, action and enforcement can be undertaken to effectively tackle these abuses. So I wanted just to say that ANCTAD, of course, continues to work on this issue. Last year, we approved the guiding policies and procedures to facilitate international cooperation between developing countries' competition authorities and developed countries' competition authorities. We certainly hope to continue this dialogue with other international organizations and networks as represented here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. <clears throat> I think it is refreshing to see uh, how um, competition policy became a component part of the policies developed by and supported by such international agencies as OECD and uh, UNCTAD. Um, dialogue between uh, developed and developing countries in this uh, uh, field uh, is really um, of the utmost importance, I think. Uh, now, uh, to finish with this uh, round of uh, interventions, uh, the floor is uh, uh, to Bill Kovacic. Bill. Mm. Thank you, Luis. You. Thank you, Margarita and Anna Sofia, for the honor of joining this session. My pitch today is that public procurement should be a high priority for competition agencies in the context of recovery. Why care? First, massive sums of money are about to be spent. The G7 last week indicated common plans to spend trillions of dollars through the procurement system. Julio just mentioned a number of the crucial areas in which governments will spend money. Wouldn't it be nice if some of the money was spent well, indeed most of it? Uh, second, procurement has special social significance. Uh, notice how much effort competition authorities have spent in recent years tying themselves in knots asking, how can we pursue a relevant social policy agenda that especially addresses inequality? Well, doing better with public procurement will do that. Uh, the main beneficiaries of good public procurement are people in the second half of the income demographic. Healthcare expenditures, education, transport. You do a good job with procurement and you're delivering huge social benefits to the dispossessed. Uh, third, if you spend the money well, you can promote dynamism. It's 60 years ago, this last week, that John Kennedy told the United States Congress we should go to the moon. The Apollo program spent funds in ways that set the foundation for the modern digital age, especially through procurement mechanisms that improve the quality of semiconductors, which are the essence of the machines we're using to do this program. So if you spend it well, you can have a tremendous dynamic impact on economic growth. And last, it's vital to civic trust. 
citizens measure in a profound way the quality of government by the quality of the procurement system because they touch its results all the time. You do a good job with procurement, the public trusts public institutions more, you do a bad job, it's a corrosive influence. What's the problem in trying to do this? Procurement systems tend to be vulnerable to collusion, they tend to be vulnerable to corruption, and they are heat sinks for political influence that moves money in the wrong directions, not on the basis of merit, but on the basis of influence. The procurement system in many ways is a giant bank. It gets robbed all the time, often with the help of insiders, and then immediately the funds are replenished for the next group of thieves to go at it again. So as you think today about pushing huge amounts of money through a procurement system that has a lot of leakage, we have a common interest in improving the of that regime. The happy element of the story is even small improvements of performance confer massive social benefits. So how to do it using competition policy? First, a better application of emerging tools that competition agencies are developing with the leadership of agencies such as the ADC. And in particular, I have the mean in mind the development of better data processing capability, uh, the better use of AI to detect patterns in collusive tendering as a way of enforcement more effectively. So the greater deployment of capabilities now being developed, state-of-the-art technology in particular. Second, learn from peers. There are dramatic improvements going around globally, promising experiments that deal with competition and public procurement. The COVID crisis has shattered the idea that you have to wait for a big international meeting to take place before you work with your counterparts. This, ve this vehicle, this medium, shows that you can use technology to talk on an almost daily basis with your counterparts. You're doing a lot of good work, and there's a good reason to join up that effort in order to work more effectively. Third technique, more cooperation at home. The good solution to the procurement and competition issues will require work that involves the following policy domains, competition, any corruption, procurement, of course, trade and intellectual property. In order to do this well, the agencies have to understand the context in which they operate, to understand the goals and limitations, the imperatives that guide other institutions, and to draw upon what Antonio referred to as their unique market experience and knowledge to provide suggestions about the way ahead. And advocacy for the future to be effective will draw upon that experience. And the final thought is that it underscores the new role for competition authorities. That is to be a resource for government, a unique resource that builds upon the special knowledge of the institutions. I'm willing to assert the competition authorities in many instances know as much about how the economy functions within their borders as other, any other government institution. And I'm including in that group the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Commerce. It's the competition agency that has the unique perspective. The agency can draw upon that experience to be an effective advocate. Advocacy that consists of saying competition is good is, well, useless is too strong a word, but it comes close. The advocacy that works is advocacy based on knowledge, saying these are my recommendations to you because this is what's going on in the economy. And what the agency can do in a profound way is understanding the constraints of other public actors and the goals they have to pursue, stepping forward with the results of their experience, economic precedents to say, these are alternatives that could make you better off. I'm not coming here to simply rebuke you or berate you. I'm here to suggest a way in which you can do your job better for the common benefit of the entire nation. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for the punch of your intervention. Um, uh, I duly took note of uh, everything you said. Uh, I think other people also took note of that. Um, we have now um, the possibility of um, um, asking uh, the um, first opinion poll um, and to um, um, does it, will it appear on the screen? Um, the first opinion poll is 
about um, the way, the best way, which means that there are several ways, and some are better than others. Uh, uh, what is the best way competitioning forces can contribute to the economic recovery? Uh, this is the question. Uh, you have now the possibility to answer by choosing one, just one, uh, of the three uh, uh, options. Uh, uh, first option A, through robust enforcement across all areas of the economy. B, through competition advocacy uh, towards state support measures and public procurement. Uh, and C, by keeping enforcement and advocacy efforts in tandem uh, for a resilient economic recovery. Who is the most in favor? Uh, uh, the columns are still moving up and down. Um, it's quite balanced uh, 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 among them. Uh, it's difficult to predict who will win. Oh, I, 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 I wait still one minute that it stabilizes, but it's still moving. <coughs> Let me, I have my own preference, of course, but I didn't vote. Uh, and uh, and I, 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 I will respect uh, strictly and scrupulously uh, uh, the result of the, the outcome of the vote. Uh, I think it's uh, now Antonio. It's, is it time to uh, um, stop the, the voting? Um, but it's still moving. Let's give some uh, another chance to uh, uh, options A and B because uh, option C um, is uh, clearly the front runner. Uh, and I, I think it's time to uh, uh, announce the result. 30% um, of the voters preferred option A, 23% um, uh, uh, voted for option B. I remind you that option A concerns robust enforcement across all the sectors of the economy. Uh, option B, uh, uh, competition advocacy. Uh, towards state support measures and public procurement, the topics uh, addressed uh, in the interventions. And uh, option C uh, is the centrist option, the eclectic option, uh, keeping enforcement and advocacy efforts in tandem for a resilient economic recovery. If I may um, uh, disclose my preference, my, pref my preference went to uh, uh, option C as well. So <coughs> No, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, time to give our guests and speakers uh, the opportunity to comment on uh, this uh, um, first opinion poll. Um, I will ask, uh, according to their own uh, preferences, I will ask uh, uh, Antonio uh, and Andreas to comment on this. Uh, first poll. And Antonio, would you like to comment on the results of this poll? Mm. Yeah, certainly. Well, I think it wasn't really that surprising to get this result, and especially if, uh, after what we heard from the panel. Uh, with, I think the, the, all the panel members uh, stressed uh, the importance of advocacy uh, and the important, importance of um, uh, enforcement for recovery. Um, again, from what I said before, from the lessons from past crises, less vigorous enforcement um, against cartels, against the abuse of dominance or in merger control uh, uh, can actually work the other way around. So having a weaker enforcement, as, as Andreas was also saying, this can actually slow down uh, uh, recovery. Uh, if we turn a uh, blind eye to cartelization, this not only impacts uh, consumers because we have higher prices and l less choice, but it also stifles uh, innovation and productivity in the long run. Um, at the same time, with, uh, with times of crisis, we normally have increased risks of, um, of concentration. 
Uh, many firms uh, may exit the market. Uh, this can lead to increased market power for those that remain or those that are allowed to acquire uh, their competitors. Uh, there will be companies that will be financially weaker uh, and those that have deeper pockets can take advantage of their vulnerability and engage in exclusionary uh, practices such as predatory pricing. Uh, so it, it becomes a lot less costly for dominant firms to engage in this kind of strategies uh, successfully. Uh, so this may require, for example, the use of interim uh, measures that we've heard uh, today, um, in, especially in markets that are changing rapidly uh, due to the crisis so that we can avoid uh, irreparable harm to competition. And it may also require competition authorities uh, to prioritize more their enforcement and to use their limited resources into sectors and practices that may have a greater impact on recovery. And I'm thinking of, of digital, of green, monitoring the cooperation's agreement that Andreas has, has mentioned. Um, however, uh, again, if enforcement is important, advocacy is extremely uh, uh, relevant. Um, and, and we have a state support of unprecedented uh, magnitude, as we've seen, with uh, 16 trillion uh, uh, of US dollars in rescue and support packages in the last year uh, worldwide. And of course, this, need, this aid has been largely uh, necessary, uh, but we do need to make sure that it is deployed in a way that doesn't unlevel the playing field and follows competitive uh, neutrality uh, principles. I think that competition authorities can help avoid that we we have long-term ha harm to, to markets. And, and as uh, Bill was saying, uh, the understanding of markets, the extensive experience that they have with using economic analysis, with tools uh, and, and evidence uh, in balancing uh, uh, com pro-competitive efficiencies with anti-competitive effects, that will be extremely useful and uh, and can bring actually credibility that experience can bring credibility to the to the table in the discussion with policymakers thank you thank you very much antonio now andreas uh, uh, would you like to add uh, something to the comments already put forward by antonio yeah, this, yeah, this, I, I this, it was just a few comments um I, I i would also have voted for for option for option three because i think we we need all instruments for the time being uh, to get well through the crisis from a competition policy point of view that is robust enforcement plus advocacy when it comes to enforcement i would very much like um to make some differentiation uh, across the various tools that we have at hand, just briefly. I think when it comes to mergers, the most important uh, issue is that we take decisions uh, that are based on facts and not on um, prognosis. What do I mean by prognosis? We have very often heard here in Germany that we are going to see a very high insolvency rate and that this will be subject to merger control that we see failed firms. A second prognosis was uh, that we would have to apply the failing firm defense uh, in, in, in a couple of cases uh, because um, of the bankruptcy of those, uh, firms. So far, I can only say both did not become true. So, uh, so far, uh, merger control to an extent is business as usual, I would say. Um, we are not under usual circumstances with regard to all this. So we should take that as a fact and we do our business here as we have done in, in the past. It may be different, as I pointed out in, 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 my, in my initial remarks with regard to uh, cooperation. Of course, we should go against cartelization the strictest way uh, as we did in the past. With regard to cooperation, again, we should not take a linear approach, but we should look at corporations um, uh, due to the fact that we have different circumstances than uh, we had. Most of the importance, of most importance for the time being, I really believe is abuse control because we see how much the crisis has strengthened um, huge ecosystems and, and gatekeepers and that competition 
and cont contestability of markets has become even more difficult during that crisis. So I think it is, again, it is of utmost importance uh, that, that we look at big tech and that we try as competition agencies how to re-implement competition in this area, how to make the markets contestable, and how to care for fair competition in these markets in a, in a certain sense. Again, let's make use of the tools that we have. Let's make use of the new tools. Uh, we, in Germany, at the Bundeskartellamt, we have initiated quite, quite a few, quite, few um, quite a couple of new proceedings against uh, the big companies on the basis of the new instruments that we have at hand. So that is important. Advocacy, to be frank, is always important, um, but has been never been more uh, important uh, than during than during this time. Um, I mean, competition agencies always are agencies that cannot come uh, like a cat out of the bush um, and, and killing the mouse. Um, I mean, we have always be to be present in in in, in the public uh, in the public, and. Uh, now it's maybe more important than ever. Again, this is why it is so useful to have this panel today on exactly this topic, because this helps us to make clear why competition is part of the solution and that why, why competition is not a problem for the time being. I stretch everything that has been said with regard to public procurement as well. I think this is also a means to help us to a certain extent out of this. So a, a good combination of both. Uh, good enforcement and good adv advocacy is exactly what we need for the time being. Thank, thank you, Andreas. I, I, I thank you both for explaining why this time at least the majority was right. Uh, uh, and the eclectic approach is uh, uh, probably the, the best one. It's, it's, moreover, it's uh, uh, extremely important for practitioners, lawyers, uh, and also for former judges. Uh, 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 in times of uncertainty uh, uh, and of risk uh, to have some guidance from the, the enforcers whose task is not uh, inviolable. Uh, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's not to envy uh, 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 in these difficult times. Uh, now, uh, to keep the dynamics of the session, we don't have uh, uh, now much time before the end, but still, still some, uh, um, um, it's a time from, uh, a quick time, a quick time for Q and answers, uh, questions and answers, sorry. And uh, I have here one or two questions I would like to uh, 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 bring to the attention of the panel and to ask the panel to answer. Uh, um, the first one uh, is, the following, um, these questions have been uh, sent by the public, uh, I don't know uh, uh, from where, but these are interesting questions. The panel has mentioned important lessons learned from past crises. How do you think competition agencies can pass those messages across and how can they contribute to economic recovery? Uh, I ask you who would like to uh, answer to these questions. Uh, if probably one of the three uh, who didn't uh, comment uh, on uh, the uh, opinion poll, the first opinion poll, um, Julio, uh, would you like to uh, Try an answer to this question. <clears throat> Shall I repeat it? The important. It's no, no. I think. We, okay. No, I, 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 no, no. I think this is something that um, I think has been. I mean, Antonio mentioned it uh, just before, based on yeah. also some work has been done in the past and more recent work by the OCD. I think uh, these empirical facts, or stylized facts. I mean, you know, this, some some of this comes from the Great Depression in, in the U.S. Some comes from the Japan. More, hopefully, can be done also. Uh, based on European evidence from the last financial crisis, and obviously the current one is too is too recent. But um, I mean, the more we can be concrete and empirical, and Bill also mentioned this before, the more effective we are. 
um, I think past merger controls, past mer I mean, exposed evidence from past mergers, be them in crisis or not crisis times, is also f very effective in this type of advocacy in really bringing this home because um, this debate is not often it's not easy, and I'm not sure I'm not sure competition authorities have too many friends out there. So the more uh, concrete and, com and convincing they can be, uh, the better. That I think it's really an issue of advocacy. Uh, then the, on the issue of enforcement, this evidence can also can be brought to bear. Now each case is, is unique, so it's difficult to really extrapolate from the past and, and use it uh, legally um, in, in in a proceeding. But I think it can inf at least inform the enforcers in what issues to look at, what fears of harm to develop, and what data to look at. So in that sense, uh, the more we can do an exposed evidence, be them from crisis or not, uh, I think uh, I think the most the more effective we are. And I think many authorities are, have tried with their scarce, scarce resources, have tried to move in that direction over the last few years. Thank you, Giulio. Um, I, uh, uh, I turn to uh, Antonio, uh, Antonio Freire, uh, not the other Antonio. Uh, um, uh, there is another question. I, I think it would be uh, 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 useful to uh, uh, put the other question. Uh, um, do, you, do we have time for that or not? Not, not very much. Okay. So uh, we'll move on to the second opinion poll. Um, otherwise, we we'll, we'll risk to be caught by time. The second opinion poll is the following: To which aspect can competition policy contribute more in building back better? A. By accelerating innovation and growth. B. A fair and inclusive recovery. And C. Pushing economic operators to be more efficient. You have on the screen uh, the three options, the question and the sh sh three options to answer. Mm. There's, uh, there is a um, clear trend in favor of the first two uh, uh, solutions. Accelerating innovation and growth, or a fair and inclusive, rec inclusive recovery. Um, but I, 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 I have witnessed some important uh, polls where the winner came from uh, the uh, same uh, level at which uh, uh, option C is now. So I would not be surprised if there, there would be a turnaround. But probably not. Probably. I think it's uh, we can close the the vote, um, and uh, uh, the winner, uh, the preferred um, answer, uh, uh, is answer A, accelerating innovation and growth, uh, followed uh, 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 closely uh, by the option B, a fair and inclusive recovery. Um, and uh, um, pushing economic operators to be more efficient uh, uh, is not the preferred option, uh, in at least at least in times of crisis, of pandemic crisis, for the recovery of the economy. Uh, 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 if 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 the situation, if uh, uh, it might be possible that the uh, uh, the difference uh, would not be. Uh, uh, so uh, wide uh, 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 in um, normal situations. What do you think? What do you think? Now I, I turn to uh, uh, our uh, guests, our speakers, uh, uh, to uh, 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 ask for their comments. W what do you think about the, 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 this this result in times of crisis, uh, in times of difficulties and risky times? Uh, uh, would it would it uh, 
My challenge is, would it be the same, the result probably, uh, we are speculating, uh, um, uh, would it be the same uh, in uh, uh, normal times? Uh, uh, now I, I ask uh, 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 Teresa, uh, 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 Julio and Bill uh, uh, to, uh, uh, if they uh, would like to comment. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> so, 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 uh, yes, it's, uh, your, you, it, it's now your turn to comment, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Teresa. Thank you, Zelda. Uh, so, uh, of course, I, I think the, the both, uh, both options A and B uh, can be combined. But, of course, uh, from the point of view of ANCTAD, we did uh, 195 members, much of, most of which are developing countries. I think it is clear that we would uh, prefer, uh, in a way, that competition policy was also contributing to a fair and inclusive recovery, even though uh, it, this would include uh, accelerating innovation and growth. And this is this comes back to what I mentioned regarding uh, small and medium sized enterprises and micro and small and medium sized enterprises, access to, for instance, digital uh, platforms through fair terms and, and conditions. I think, of course, um, a fair and some problems um, in the connection. I, I think it's common to all the participants. Let's the, remain um, Teresa, um, open. Can, can you resume? Because we lost you uh, for for oh, a while. For the last the, the last minute, or the last 30 uh, seconds. Is it better now? It's much better now, yes. I will try to speak uh, slow, slowly. Then it's I was just fault. saying that from I, I don't know it's the the Wi-Fi connection where I am. I'm I'm afraid. From Anktat's point of view, of course, a fairer and inclusive uh, green recovery is the goal. But this is uh, innovation, uh, investment, um, access by uh, all and medium-sized companies to digital platforms. So what we would recommend is the holistic uh, policy approach, which combines different instruments, but which, of course, encompasses a strong role uh, from competition law and policy. I think it is extremely important um, mentioning um, other speakers uh, highlights this idea of advocacy, namely through guidance, because focusing again on the very small uh, businesses and players, it is very important not only that they fully understand the requirements and even the constraints brought by competition law and policy, but also that, that through this guidance, they understand what are the boundaries um, to have um, predictability, to have transparency. And I think this serves all uh, market players. I also wanted to mention that, of course, when we think of the digital economy, not only competition law and policy, but the combination with uh, regulation, namely ex ante regulation, which uh, I believe it's very much illustrated by a number of imp important pieces of legislation in Europe and in other countries, for instance, Japan, are uh, very important. So I, I think we should combine uh, both and, and of course, uh, accelerating innovation and growth will obviously also push economic operators to be more efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, now we are running out of time, but uh, uh, I ask Julio to uh, comment also on this, uh, the result of this opinion poll. It's, uh, it's a nice result. I think uh, I'm quite keen on competition policy fostering in innovation, so I, I like it. Uh, I was a bit surprised by how close number two came because it, it's true that in many in many ways uh, competition can foster inclusive and fair outcomes, but that's not always the case. I mean, when market forces are uh, strong, it, it may lead to some uh, you know winners of the race that, that lead to greater inequality, and uh, and that's part of the competitive process. And I think there, again, you need other government policies 
be it fiscal policy or social policy to, to complement competition policy, ensure that uh, the welfare outcomes that we desire in society as a whole are, are achieved. So again, a bit like I was mentioning earlier, for in terms of environmental and green, uh, green policies, there's a strong complementarity across the tool set the governments have and um, competition policy shouldn't try to achieve all goals. I think you should focus on, on the competitive process and on uh, efficient outcomes and then have a complementary tools uh, intervene on other goals that society may want to pursue. Thank you, thank, thank you, you very much, Julio. And Bill, what do you think of the, this result? Yeah, in a university, you tell students not to fight the question, just answer it. Uh, uh, I'm gonna fight the question a little bit. I don't see the two silos as being completely, first and second, being completely unrelated. Uh, as an academic, I can contrive links between them and I'll do a bit of it now. Uh, uh, one question is, where do you get innovation? And I suppose one answer to that is you want markets to be permeable in the sense that people with good ideas have an opportunity to realize the fullest possible expression of their ideas. And to the extent that that means giving smaller firms an opportunity to uh, use their talents effectively, uh, to uh, enter markets, expand, get financing, develop uh, supply chain links, uh, that's an important element of innovation. So I can see, I can see a spillover between the, between the two, two areas. Uh, uh, I, I agree with Julio's intuition too, though, which is that uh, you know if you if you look at the literature about what promotes growth, it's innovation first and foremost in products, in processes, in uh, in business organization. Uh, if you don't have innovation and growth, you're not going to have the money to carry out the distributional aims that are that are so important to all of the current policy uh, initiatives. And, and goodness knows our governments have committed themselves to spend a lot of money to promote recovery. Where's it going to come from? You're going to have to have some innovation and growth. Uh, it's often seen as an easy way out for competition people to say, oh, well, the distribution problems will be taken care of through other programs. Uh, I would think that governments have learned enough through this recent experience and maybe from the GFC before it that if that additional collateral set of policies are not in place, that is the formula for an absolute corrosion of civic trust in a politically combustible environment. So if you do not deliver on that promise, you've set yourself up for a great deal of difficulty. Uh, and, and, and just a reminder that Julio, Julio just mentioned as well, which is that competition, uh, citizens don't always like competition. Competition is destructive. It displaces industries. It crushes specific firms, uh, not because they're not good, it's because someone came up with a better idea and, and simply wiped them away. So, so competition creates tremendous social dislocation, which again, I think points us back to the, to the realization that you have to have social investments that provide a measure of insurance that uh, increase flexibility and adaptability. And that it's not enough for us simply to say, well, governments should do that too. I think we have to realize and ask ourselves, maybe as part of a larger discussion, how do we drive home the idea that these additional investments are indispensable to making the competition system politically palatable and, and legitimate? Thank you, Thank you Bill. Uh, we, uh, I think we have uh, 30 seconds for, uh, uh, left for, uh, I'm sorry uh, f for that. that, that those are my instructions, uh, uh, and I'm very disciplined, uh, as the uh, um, speakers have been, and I am very grateful uh, to them. But uh, now, uh, each of you would have, I'm sorry, 30 seconds to, uh, uh, for a last um, uh, intervention to uh, uh, if, um, possibly uh, uh, answer uh, 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 the uh, other speakers' interventions, uh, or to uh, make a last, uh, a final comment. Uh, I start with Bill. So the opposite, the opposite to, order. To do to do any of this work well requires a body of knowledge, and to build the knowledge to inform policy now, you can't go out and create it immediately. It's got to be there. If you're going to fight this battle, this is not the time to begin building an aircraft carrier. You have to have the aircraft carrier already. So how do you marshal the knowledge and go about doing this? 
the agencies must on a continuing basis over time invest in building the base of knowledge and forming partnerships with academic hubs and others to make sure that when the crisis hits, you have an inventory of ideas to apply to it. I think the crisis underscores the importance of competition policy, research and development as an indispensable component of what competition agencies do. Thank you very much, Bill. Teresa. Thank you. Um, well, cooperation, international cooperation, regional cooperation, uh, well, of course, bringing together countries, UNCTAD sees itself as networking the networks. We will be discussing uh, competition advocacy during and in the aftermath of COVID-19 crisis in our annual group of experts meeting, meeting in Geneva, but available also uh, online between 7 and 9 of July. And uh, I, I do believe that sharing information and knowledge, especially to support the most um, vulnerable and uh, those who are more resource constrained or are younger, I mean competition authorities, is an extremely important um, task to perform in current times. And I hope we can continue this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Now, oh, Julio, please. Perhaps just one point that um, clearly competition enforcement, advocacy, and also research analysis takes time and takes resources. Time where we already are in it, actually, where public resources are quite constrained for non-recovery type activities. And it's important authorities remain well staffed and supported over this period because uh, now and in the future, I think this, uh, for, for this work to be effective, it needs to be well resourced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julio. Now, Antonio, please. And I fully agree with uh, with Julio. Uh, and uh, but at the same time, I think that competition authorities need to prioritize better their their enforcement and actually look at the sectors that may have a greater impact uh, on the on the economy. And of course, I wanted to mention uh, international cooperation as well, coming from the from the OECD on two main areas. One on competitive neutrality. I think that there's still a lot of work to be done on guidance uh, to competition authorities, to governments on how to deal with, with, with state support. We have the competition, competitive neutrality recommendation, but we still need to make it implementable. And the second one is on digital. Um, we've heard a lot of countries uh, are developing their own approaches. The, the European uh, Commission, the European Union is uh, developing the, uh, its approach, the UK, Germany, etc. I think it would be uh, indeed good to have cooperation here, make sure that we have consistency and ultimately eventually even conversions uh, in the uh, approaches. Um, and a final, a final word to say, uh, let's recover the economy, but let's be careful not to winners um, and uh, and close uh, markets because it's very important that we keep uh, relying on open markets thank you so much thank you antonio thank you very much andreas your final step yeah, just, just briefly uh, on international cooperation i think uh, the crisis has really sharpened our senses uh, how much we need cooperation but at the same time i think we can be very happy that we have reacted so fast together. If you see how fast we have set up joint communication on how to react in the crisis as competition agencies, in, in both uh, frameworks, in the ECN as well as in the ICN, how fast the OECD uh, has been caring about the subject. I think it was a great experience that, that um, cooperation worked and uh, that, that, those, that this really works well and that we could do more in this respect. Second point, again, on the digital economy. I think here again, the, the crisis has sharpened all our senses that we need to do more in order to bring competition into the digital arena, into the digital economy. I fully agree with Antonio that, that in, in best of all work, we always would have a parallel approach and, and have parallel proceedings and joint approaches. Um, but I think that will happen in due time, and we're we're on a on a good path here. And the the, the crisis has really accelerated our, our thinking and the way we get these kind of issues. Um, last but not least, 
at least in my agency, a crisis has also brought a boost to digitalization of the agency itself and the methods we are, will be able to use in, in the future. I think that is an important point that also here uh, we, have, we are very conscious that we have to change also as an agency, making use of new enforcement tools, making use of new investigation methods based on uh, digital tools. I think that is also a great result. So um, uh, a, as always, a crisis at the same time is also a chance with a view to the development in the future, and we should might, might try to make use of it. Thank you very much, Andreas. And now it's uh, 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 the end of our uh, uh, work in this panel. I very much uh, thank our speakers for the uh, uh, extraordinary contributions they gave to understand uh, uh, how um, competition policy can work and should work and contribute to uh, um, uh, 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 overcome uh, the uh, results of the economic and social uh, uh, consequences of this uh, uh, ex extreme crisis that we, are, we, are, we uh, went through uh, the last times. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now it's the end. Thank you.